say hi to somebody, right? It wouldn't kill you, right? Wave at somebody, greet somebody. There we go. It wasn't so hard, was it? So I'll tell you what, if you're in the elementary school, so like preschool through fifth grade, you guys are dismissed. If you're in the junior high or the high school, it is your Sunday to be in with us, and we are awfully glad to have you with us. Uh, see, it looks like most of them already knew that, so they stayed home. See how that works? So um, if you're visiting with us today, God bless you guys. It is a rough chapter today. So I'm just going to trust that the Lord brought you on the day that he wanted you to be here. And uh, we're going through the book of Revelation, which is, of course, the book that details the coming sort of consummation of human history as we know it, as God uh, uh, finishes up with this current world and heads us on into eternity. And we're going to be in chapter 9 this morning, and uh, things are getting rough. But if you're here with us today, then I trust that God has a word for you. And let's just pray and just really ask him to bless our text today and to give us understanding uh, from it. So, so let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today. And uh, as Susie prayed, Lord, we just thank you for the privilege of being here together and being able to open up your word, Lord. We know that you have things that you want to speak to each one of us through it, Lord. And so we pray that you'd give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to us today, Lord, to each one of us as individuals, Lord, what your spirit would say to all of us uh, collectively as your church. And Father, we pray that the teaching ministry of your spirit would be manifest here today. And we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Revelation chapter 9. And you know that starting back in chapter 6, we've kind of been looking at the beginning of what we've called the wrath of the Lamb. It's these first set of judgments. Remember the seal judgments. And these are the judgments that are going to occur probably during that first half or the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, likely just after we are raptured, we're taken out of here to be in heaven with the Lord. And remember those very quickly, the, the very first seal was the, the rise of the Antichrist to power, right? This coming future final world dictator. And then as a result of that, we see there was war and there was famine and there was death all of those things that follow as a result of him coming to power. And we saw that through those first four seal judgments, that a quarter of the world's population will be killed during those judgments. Remember, the fifth seal was the souls of the martyrs there under the heavenly altar, those who were martyred for their faith in Jesus during that time. And then the sixth seal kind of started out with a bang, right? It was this cosmic during that time. And then the sixth seal kind of started out with a bang, right? It was this cosmic chaos, the beginning of this world catastrophe and upheaval. In chapter 7, remember, we looked at, we kind of answered that question that they asked at the end of chapter 6, who will be able to stand underneath this judgment? And we saw that there were two groups that could stand or would be saved during this time of tribulation. And that was the sealed Jews. Remember, those are the 144,000 of God's chosen missionaries from the Jewish people. And then as a fruit of their labors, we looked at that second group, which was the saved multitude. These are all the people that are going to come to Christ during the tribulation and survive through this time to inherit the millennial kingdom. Last week, we looked at chapter 8, and we looked at the opening of what was the seventh seal, which then introduced the next set of judgments, the seven trumpets, which will then, we said, introduce the final set of judgments, which are the seven bowls. And as we looked at our passage last time, remember we looked at just the first four of the seven trumpet judgments. And the, the first four had to do, first of all, with, remember, the desolation of the earth. 
right? That first trumpet, we saw fire mixed with hail and a third of all the trees on the earth were destroyed. The second trumpet, it said that something like a burning mountain was cast into the sea. And remember, we saw that a third of the sea turned to blood. A third of the sea creatures were killed. A third of the ships on the sea were destroyed. That third trumpet was that bitter star wormwood, remember, that fell from the sky into the rivers and it polluted one third of the fresh water supply across the planet. The fourth trumpet, we called the delumination of the sky, remember, because one third, it said, of the light of the sun and the stars and the moon was completely blacked out. And in all of this, we pointed out what's important to see is that all of this we see God restraining his judgment. It's a measured judgment in that only a third of each of the affected targets was affected. Um, God's desire in all of this, of course, that people would see what's happening and that they would repent. And then we watched, remember, our very last verse last time, God sent yet another warning. Remember that proclamation of the angel. In verse 13 of chapter 8, John wrote that I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So remember, this angel, right, a literal messenger from God, flying through the heavens, basically giving this warning to the world that you ain't seen nothing yet, right? That these next three coming judgments would be even worse than everything you've already endured. Now we ask, what could be worse? Right? What could be worse than what we've already seen? Well, we're gonna see exactly that this morning. Because what we've seen is that all of these judgments so far have largely been focused on the physical, focused on trees and vegetation and oceans and rivers and plants and ships, right? But now we look at two judgments of a very different type. Because what we're going to see this morning are spiritual judgments. We're going to see demons from the spiritual realm actually unleashed to impact people in what is an absolutely unprecedented way. So thanks for showing up today. I'm glad you're here, right? Amen. It's almost as if we come to this particular chapter at this particular point in the revelation and the Lord in essence declares to the world, he says, you want Satan? You want the devil more than me, then Satan you will have, he says, but I promise you, it will not be nearly as much fun as you think that it will be. And I think that we're gonna see as we go through chapter nine, right, as this, after the sounding of this fifth trumpet, we're gonna see John gives us all kinds of extra explanation to what's happening. And I think that this shows us that this is a most important step in this sort of progressive increasing judgments that the Lord is bringing. We're also gonna see that as John tries to describe what it is he sees unleashed from the spiritual realm, we're gonna see that both his language and his descriptions do start to become a bit more symbolic as he describes these literal events. And it begins right here in the first couple verses with the opening of the abyss. Look at verse one of Revelation chapter nine. It says, then the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Now we just saw a star fall from heaven, didn't we, in the third of the trumpet judgments? And yet this is something that's very different. That, we said, was likely a literal star, right? A comet or a meteor or an asteroid or, or whatever. But this star is an individual. 
And we know that because we see that John calls him a he here in verse 2. Later, he's going to refer to him as a king over this demonic horde down in 11. And so we can very rightly assume that this star fallen from heaven is Satan himself. It's the archangel Lucifer, right, fallen from grace in eternity past. Because notice the language specifically John uses here. He says he saw a star fall n from heaven, right? Not falling from heaven, but this fall was something that had already happened prior to this. And remember we've said a couple different times that there are 404 verses in the book of Revelation and that 278 of those verses are clear references to the Old Testament. And so the book of Revelation really unfolds to the person who is willing to interpret it in light of the prior revelation that was given to us in the Old Testament. And where we reread about Satan's fall in Isaiah chapter 14, it says, how you are fallen from heaven, notice the very same language there, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who destroyed the nations. Satan's aim has always been to destroy the people of this planet through his deception so that he can ultimately bring about their destruction. And now we see that he's allowed through this judgment sort of to take the next step in his evil plan, even as, notice that Satan continues to serve God even through his rebellion, Because here, God's the one giving him this key to some sort of a bottomless pit. Look what it says in verse 2. It says that he opened the bottomless pit and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Now, this bottomless pit is probably not exactly Hades, it's probably not exactly hell, but rather we think it's a a prison somewhere in the underworld, in the center, most likely, of the earth. And it's the place where certain demons have been confined by God. The New Testament, Jude, uh, verse 6, it tells us that the angels who did not keep their proper domain, in other words, those who didn't keep their positions of authority that they were given, angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So Jude tells us, by the Spirit of God, that there are fierce, fierce, disobedient demons who are being held. Of necessity, they are being held because if they were let loose, they would simply wreak too much destruction, and so they are confined. And you remember in the account in Luke chapter 8, remember after Jesus cast that whole legion of demons out of the demoniac there on Gadara. And you remember that the demons begged Jesus. They begged that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. But instead, remember that they asked that he would send them into this herd of pigs, which he did. Now, just that in and of itself is fascinating theologically because it is said to have been the very first deviled ham. (laughs) You had to know, right? You guys had to know that one was coming. Okay, back to Luke 8. When the demons speak there of the abyss, it's speaking of this bottomless pit here. This is the bottomless pit where Satan himself is going to be confined during the thousand-year reign of Jesus on the earth. Revelation chapter 20, we're told that Satan is going to be bound at the end of the tribulation and cast 
by an angel into the bottomless pit and shut up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. So this is a place of imprisonment. It's a place of darkness and of fire. And John compares it here to a great furnace, right? We just imagine the smoke billowing out of it as it's unlocked. Kind of like, it's not a volcano, but it's sort of like a volcano that is erupting and some of that kind of pent up power there at the earth's core is just allowed to escape. And so the abyss is very much like hell if it isn't hell itself. Now, we as people so often joke about hell, don't we? Comedians have whole routines they do about hell. But there is not, you can be sure, there is not any joking about hell in hell itself. Because it is not funny at all. It is a tragic place to end up. It's not the place where you're partying for all eternity with your buddies. Hell is a tragic place to end up. Notice even the demons do not want to be in hell. Think about that. Even they don't want to be there, and yet they've already been sentenced to eventually go there. But each one of us, as human beings, we have a choice related to that. I do think that it's fascinating to kind of stop and consider that somewhere on the face of the earth, there is some sort of a lock on some sort of a controlled shaft that leads right down into the abyss, right down into the abode of imprisoned demons. And we have no way of knowing where this shaft is, and yet it's somewhere. Some have suggested maybe Sacramento. Right? No, that's, that wasn't fair. That was a wee off size, right? But imagine this, imagine you buy a home. This is not the kind of thing that's on the disclosure forms, right? <laughs> you know, are you aware of the key, you know, the shaft to the abyss in your backyard? It really doesn't matter because notice this shaft is going to stay locked until precisely this point, until precisely this time when the key is given to Satan to open it up. And that, I think, in and of itself is worth making note of. It's something I think that we need to remind ourselves of, is that Satan can't open this pit until God allows him to open this pit. Remember, Satan can only do what he's allowed to do when he's allowed to do it. And sometimes we can get this idea that Satan's in charge of things either here in the world or that he's running something during the tribulation. The truth is, Satan is not in charge of anything. He can't open the abyss until he's given a key and he's allowed to open it. It's God who's in charge of this universe. God's the one in charge of this world. And it is a wonderful thing when he's the one who's in charge of our lives. And so in human history, there is no doubt about exactly how it's going to end. And the devil is in no kind of place where he gets to determine how this thing ends. God is going to be the one to determine that. And he's going to determine it for this world, and he's also going to determine it for your life and for my life. So understand this morning that God's plan is not in any danger of being derailed by the devil because Satan continues to be a very unwilling servant of God. All through his rebellion against God, he continues to serve the purposes of God. And here, he serves it by opening up this bottomless pit. We see all of this smoke billowing out. And look what happens in verse 3. Now it really gets interesting. It says, Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. And to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God 
on their foreheads. So, are these literal locusts or something else? Well, in a word, they're something else entirely. So, because the pit is a prison for the worst of the worst of the demons, it's much more likely that these locusts are some sort of demonic creature that are released from the pit and allowed to torment men. So the fifth trumpet is this demonic horde. They're compared to locusts since plagues of locusts were very common during uh, in the times there in Israel. Sometimes they were brought by God as a judgment, right? We see the eighth plague against Egypt was locusts. Uh, Joel chapter 2, we see a plague of locusts sent. The fact that they're not literal locusts is clear from the warning here not to harm any of the vegetation. And that's what locusts do, right? We're going to see later that they have a king over them. We're going to see later that they're described with these incredible characteristics that are not at all characteristic of literal locusts but they're described here as locusts just because of their sheer number and the incredible devastation that they are about to bring. It's recorded that the worst locust plague in modern times occurred in the Middle East in 1951 and 52, all throughout Iran and Iraq and Jordan and Saudi Arabia. And it was reported that every green growing thing over thousands of miles was completely devoured. And there was just a barrenness and a desolation as far as you possibly could see. And these demons are likened first to locusts because of these, this insatiable, voracious appetite that they have to destroy and to kill. And we notice that their target is all of mankind. Except for who? Except for those who have the seal of God on their foreheads. Right? They're forbidden to touch those people. So that, of course, would be the sealed Jews, right? The 144,000. I also believe that it would include the saved multitude, right? Those who have come to faith already during this time. And as we go on, we're going to see that even beyond these people... Right, so these are the people that were that God has protected from the locusts doing any harm, but even beyond this, these demon locusts are restrained by the Lord in the kind of harm they can do to the rest of the people of the earth. Look at verse 5. It says that they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. So as this horde of demons is led out from this pit, notice they have very clear boundaries that are placed upon them. They're limited to torment, but not to kill in the very same way that the sting of a scorpion, for the most part, is just incredibly painful, but won't kill a person. Of course, scorpions, very much native to the Holy Land, their main weapon is the sting that they have in their tails, and they're used in the Bible as a symbol of painful judgment. And notice the picture that the Spirit here paints through the Apostle John is that the torment that will be inflicted by these demonic creatures will be so awful. It says that people will desire desperately to die just as a relief from the pain, but they will not be able to die. And instead, it's very clear that they will suffer this excruciating agony for five full months. Think about it. No death at all whatsoever on the face of the earth for five months because God will not permit it. Right? John says they'll desire to die, but death will flee from them. 
Right? So people during this time will be desperately attempting to commit suicide to escape this horrible demonic torment by whatever means they might try, but their souls will absolutely not vacate the body for five months. There will be nothing that can release a person from this pain and this suffering. Now, at this point, I want to exhort us, we need to be very, very careful here. Be very, very careful here in all of this if somehow you're tempted to think that all of this somehow looks like some sort of cruel and unusual punishment on the part of God toward the human population of the world at this time. Because I think that to think that is to miss the point entirely. Because in reality, this is nothing less than pure, pure, pure grace on the part of God. Because what God is doing here is that he's giving the people who still are remaining on the earth at this time, those people who are still actively living in rebellion against him, he's giving them a five-month taste of what the torment of an eternity in hell is going to be like. And believe me, it's going to be far worse torment than the sting of these demons or any kind of physical thing that can happen to us in this world. It's that constant, never-ending sting throughout the whole body of regret and of sorrow and of grief and of torment of being separated from God. And understand that once a person ends up in hell, once a person ends up in the eternal lake of fire, the uh, the inability to escape it by death does not go on for five months. It goes on forever and ever and ever. There is no death in hell. There is no death in eternity. There is no hope at all for any kind of escape from it, even through death. Understand that we were created for eternity, and we, every one of us, will live eternally. It's just a question of where we will live eternally. And so here God, in an effort to get them to repent of their rebellion, again, he gives them just this taste of where it is they're headed for all eternity unless they repent. Because at this point, understand, they still have time to repent. See, this is completely God's grace. And I think that as we read the book of Revelation, we have to be very careful not to fall into that temptation where we somehow put ourselves in the place of being God's judge. And that somehow we are evaluating his holy actions. We need to remember the simple fact, we need to repeat as required, God is way smarter than I am. He is way more loving than I am. He is way more gracious than I could ever be. You know, God doesn't need to tell us everything. He doesn't need to tell us everything. He doesn't need us to understand why he does what he does. But the fact is that he knows what he does. And what he does, he knows, is right and it's holy and it's gracious and it's loving. So don't ever doubt the wisdom and the love of God as we read these things all about what happens in the tribulation. Because haven't we seen every step of the way, the way God continues working and working and working, just trying to get through to these people? Trying to get them to repent of their sin and make them understand that they need to turn to the Son for their salvation. And there may be some of you here this morning, maybe you're in the middle of five months, right, or, or more, of inescapable pain. Right? Maybe you're sort of suffering from the sting of your past decisions or maybe somebody else's past actions and you just desperately want out 
from under the pain. But God says, no, I won't allow it. He says, stay where you are and turn to me. And you say, no, I'm just going to keep doing things my way. And so he says, okay, suit yourself. Scorpions, right? But he continues to use that pain to bring us to that place where we'll finally surrender to him. It's just like he, remember with Pharaoh, he tried to get through to Pharaoh one plague after another, after another, because he continued to refuse to repent. So he's still trying to get through to these people of the earth at this time. And God knows that he needs to keep kind of ratcheting things up to get their attention. And so this is perhaps the most horrifying time in the history of the earth brought by this horde, uh, this demonic horde upon the earth. And look what John tells us. Watch the way he tries to describe this frightening force. In verse 7, he says that the shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. And on their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like the breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Notice the way as John just tries to describe, right? He's trying to find the words to, to describe this horror that he saw, these demonic locust-like creatures. Notice how he keeps saying they were like this and they were like that, right? Like horses prepared for battle, right, with these crowns of gold, right, which would indicate that they have authority to do what they're doing, right, that they're invincible in a sense. There's nothing that can stop them. He says they have human faces, right? Maybe they have a, a human-like kind of an intelligence or an awareness about them. The fact that they have women's hair, that speaks of a, a sense of outward beauty that's associated with these demons, right? There, there's something insidious, but something attractive and very alluring about them. But notice he said they have lion's teeth, right? Deadly. No one can escape their bite, right? They have breastplates of iron, right? Maybe they're heartless, right? Cold, cruel in what they're doing, completely insensitive to the torment they're causing. Or perhaps this is some sort of a defense that would make them hard to kill if you could even kill them. And the idea here is that the total impact of this picture is one of an unnatural, awesome cruelty. And I love the way that one author put it. He said, there seems to be no alternative to concluding that God, satisfying the age-long desire of those wicked spirits to possess bodies of their own, has created bodies for them, bodies appropriate in demonic appearance to the character of the demonic inhabitants. And then, to add to the terror, John says they had wings that sounded like horse-drawn chariots rushing into battle. So as if to look at these things wasn't terrifying enough, when this overwhelming horde of demonic beings starts to use their wings, it will be like an inescapable thunder, a, a, a lose control of everything kind of a terror that will grip people all across the planet as a result. And if any of you were living here, maybe you remember, remember we had that medfly invasion, right, in 89 or 90 or something like that, and overnight how they would spray that malathion, the, the helicopters would come and spray it everywhere. And I remember that even though we knew what it was, even though we knew when it was coming, the sound of those helicopters just thundering overhead in the dark of night 
right above your bedroom, right? Pass after pass. It was more than just a little unnerving. But this is going to be a terror that no one can possibly escape. There's going to be nowhere to hide from these locusts. Thousands and thousands. It's like thousands and thousands of those helicopters, right, roaring overhead. But I think in verse 11, we see the most terrifying thing about this horde is that it says, and they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. So this assault isn't random, it's organized, it's planned, it's overwhelming, and it is headed up by Satan himself. Right? Abaddon in Hebrew, Apollyon in Greek, both of those words mean destroyer. And that is exactly who Satan is in any language and to all people. Notice the spirit is very clear. To the Jew or to the Gentile, Satan is an equal opportunity destroyer. It doesn't matter who you are, that is all that Satan wants to do with people is destroy lives. And his names alone just reveal this all-consuming lust that he has to destroy the works of God and to destroy the people of God. And so here the devil and all of the demonic realm kind of show their true colors, right, which is to destroy mankind. Jesus said concerning the devil in John chapter 10, he said that the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. And understand in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, right, Paul warns us that Satan and his fallen demons can come to us as angels of light. Right? There is something that can be so alluring, right? That's the hook, isn't it? When he's trying to hook you. And Satan can lure people in with all kinds of different things. But rest assured, he has one thing on his mind, and that's to destroy people both presently, but more so for eternity. He wants to take as many people to hell with him so that they would find themselves separated from God for all eternity rather than to be with God for all eternity, which is God's heart for us. So no matter your language, no matter your culture, no matter your social status, no matter your education, the devil always does one thing. He is bent on your destruction. So that's the first woe. The first woe is this terrifying reality that will come upon the people of the earth who are in rebellion. It's a time of unprecedented suffering right here. Satan and his demons are revealed for what they really are. They're destroyers of people. And though they're restrained by God, still allowing people time to repent. It says in verse 12 that one woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Well, isn't that great, right? We've got two more of these things. Just one that we're going to look at this morning. It says the sixth angel in verse 13. The sixth angel sounded, so this is the second of those woes. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the trumpet from the sixth angel brings this declaration from a voice that comes there from the heavenly altar. Remember, both the earthly tabernacle and the earthly temple are just copies of what we know exists in heaven. So here we have that four-horned altar. That was the altar of sacrifice. Interestingly, of course, you notice it was bronze 
here on earth. It's gold up in heaven. But here you have this representation of this golden altar of the holiness of God. And his holiness is about to come in contact with the sheer wickedness of the world. And out of necessity, that's going to be expressed. It's going to turn, if you will, into judgment. And that judgment is going to be executed, it says, by these four angels who've been bound at the great river Euphrates. Now these four angels are anything but what we think of as angelic. Again, these are clearly demons, right? They are fallen angels because holy angels do not need to be bound. Some have suggested that these might be some of the most wicked angels that Peter writes about In 2 Peter chapter 2, he says that God cast them down, delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Again, these are very, very fierce demons, so powerful, so destructive, that if they had been allowed to remain free, then they would have just gone through the whole earth and immediately set themselves to immediately destroy whatever is in their path. And yet look at the way they've been bound there, it says, at the great river Euphrates. So bound up somewhere in the vicinity of what we know as modern day Iraq, they've been kept there until it came time for them to serve God's purposes. In verse 15, it says the four angels who'd been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. So first of all, just notice with me, these four angels have been reserved and have been preserved and have been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year of God's schedule. And only then is it now their task, it seems, to orchestrate the slaying of another one-third of the earth's population. Remember the fourth seal, that pale horse of death, remember the fourth seal resulted in a fourth of the earth's population to be killed. Here we have another third of the remaining population Put to death. So in these two judgments alone, without any of the intervening judgments we've seen, that would account for the death of half of the earth's population. And yet as we read on, we're going to see that these four angels actually enlist the help of men to accomplish their mission. It says in verse 16, that the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million, and I heard the number of them. So it seems that once released, these demons organize into battle armies of horsemen totaling 200 million soldiers. Now, some interpreters understand these 200 million to be demons, but it's more likely that this is an army made up of men who are maddened by demons and driven into battle. So the sixth trumpet is this demonically inspired army. Now, we're going to see later in the book of Revelation that as the armies of the earth assemble for Armageddon, right, that final battle during which Jesus will return to the earth, we're going to see that those armies are actually all lured there by the influence of demons. Now, this isn't the battle of Armageddon itself. because We won't come to that till chapter 16. But some do connect this with a large invasion that we're told about that's going to come from the east and the north, which is predicted in Daniel chapter 11. Now, 200 million soldiers... That might seem like kind of an astounding number. But interestingly, way back in 1965, communist China claimed 
It was written about in an article in Time magazine, Communist China claimed that it could field a traditional army of 200 million men. Back then. So this kind of a staggering number is certainly possible, especially by today's numbers. It also seems to me that 200 million is kind of a random number, just to be a complete coincidence. So I'll just say this, if this isn't an actual human army that's driven by demons, then it's a demonic army of actual demons, which would actually be worse for the world. At any rate, this satanic force is not like any other army, either in appearance or the weapons that it uses. Look at verses 17 through 19. He says, And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red and hyacinth blue and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. And by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. So fire, brimstone, smoke, these seem to kind of be the chief weapons of this 200 million strong force. Now, many might and many have looked at this and they believe that what John's trying to do 2,000 years ago is describe the kind of modern military weaponry that we see today, but with which John would have been totally unfamiliar with, right? This emphasis on fire and flame and smoke, which is so common, right, with weaponry today, whether it's surface-to-surface -surface missiles or tactical vehicle-mounted rockets or handheld RPGs, or maybe this is a whole different kind of a, a ride-on weapon, right? Either something we don't know about yet or something that hasn't even been invented yet. I do think it's interesting Notice John points out that it's the horses, and specifically it's the heads and the tails of the horses, not so much the horsemen. That's what actually does the killing. And that would be fitting, wouldn't it, if we're talking about some kind of modern military technology. But what I don't want us to do is to get too caught up in all of this speculation. Because what's most significant about this 200 million man army is that because it is set into motion by these four fallen angels of teen, that this army is made up of much more than just, you know, military generals and their weapons and even their warfare expertise because from John's heavenly vantage point, what he is seeing is nothing less than the demonic realm being unleashed to directly impact the nations. So again, it, it's the overall impression of this army and the horses. That's much more important, I think, than these details. One thing we can say is that whatever these things are, they are not good, right? And they bring about the bloodshed and death unlike anything the world has ever seen. We have two more verses left, and I will say this, that as shocking as this entire chapter may well have been, the most shocking part, I think, is revealed in these next two verses. Because even after all of these things, even after the opening of the abyss, even after this demonic horde, even after this demonically inspired army, what we see next, it says in verse 20, is but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands 
that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. If you are an underliner or a circler or a highlighter, then you should definitely underline, circle, or highlight those three words, did not repent, both in verse 20 and again in verse 21. We would think that during this time, right, this unprecedented time of suffering and death, literally as hell is unleashed upon the earth, we would expect that multitude of their rebellion and turn to Jesus, but it just does not happen. And notice with me what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that they could not repent, because that would make God responsible. But it says two different times, two different times so that we don't miss the point. It says that they did not repent. That makes them responsible. They had the room to repent. They had the space to repent. They had the opportunity to repent, but they chose not to repent. And notice what it was they did not repent of. Notice what it was that they chose instead of choosing to turn to God. It was the works of their hands. Oh, how they loved their materialism, right? And idol worship and murder and sorceries, sexual immorality, thefts. And you look at this terrible list and the one thing we see is that Satan is behind every one of those things. Satan is behind every one of those things in the exaltation of these things above the name of heaven, right? Worshiping anything else besides the God of heaven. Understand this, Satan doesn't care what we worship as long as it's not the God of heaven because Satan himself is at the heart of all that other stuff. The Bible is very clear that an idol that sits in a temple or a little idol even that someone has in their house, that that idol is nothing. Right? If you have a little statue in your house, and if that little statue wants to go from the kitchen to the living room, well, you have to carry it there, right? Because it ha it's nothing. It has no power. But I'll tell you what is something and what does have power. It's the demon behind that idol. Make no mistake, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church that there is a demon behind all idolatry. And those demons are very, very serious about what they do. And the point here is that there's a, a demonic idolatry. And understand by idolatry, anything we put ahead of the Lord, anything that we give that place of priority and that place of preeminence in our lives ahead of the Lord, that's an idol. And this is the spirit that these people are tapped into and they don't want to give that up for God. Wherever you find idolatry, you always find ignorance, you always find immorality, you find people that are driven by this desire to experience something that's bigger than themselves, something that takes them outside of the normal reality, something that helps them make a connection with something that's supernatural. Interestingly, I'm sure many of you know this, the word there for sorceries in verse 21 is a very specific Greek word. It's the Greek word pharmakia, which of course is where we get our English words pharmacist or pharmaceutical, and it simply means having to do with drugs. And it's the very same word that's tr translated witchcraft in the book of Galatians. It's translated sorcerers later in the book of Revelation because it's talking about mind-altering drugs that were used in the worship 
of the occult. And you think about the, the amount of money and the kingdoms that are established on the money that's made just here in the United States on the basis just of drugs. You look at all that comes as a result of people trying to use drugs, that insatiable appetite, right? Murders and thefts and violence and immorality, but they will not give up their drugs at this point, even to be saved and to follow God. And what's interesting, you look at all the things in this list, murders and violence and theft and sorceries and interest in the occult and sexual immorality and drug use and the increasing legalization and the acceptance of it, all you have to do, right, is scroll through your morning news feed and it reads exactly like verses 20 and 21, but the truth is it's only going to get much worse because there's this spirit behind all of this that our fallen flesh loves and that it craves even more than God. And it craves it at all costs in every area of life. Quickly, it's interesting, but you notice in verse 20 that the Holy Spirit, right, writing through John, first addresses the violation of the Ten Commandments that were associated with the first tablet of the law that was given to Moses. Remember, the first tablet of the law had everything to do with man's relationship with God, right? And so it deals there in verse 20 with idolatry and the things that are, we worship instead of worshiping God. Then in verse 22, the Spirit goes on to address the violation of the commandments that were written on the second tablet. All of those things have to do with man's relationship with other man, right? And we, see, we talk about murders, right? Sorceries, drugs, sexual immorality, thefts. And I think that the point of all of this is that we see that people are deliberately, willfully, incurably, at war with every commandment of God and they simply will not back down from it. And this is gonna be the condition of people in the world at this time, but isn't it also the condition of so many people already toward these things in the world today? We think about the fight that goes on related to the Ten Commandments, right? Or just the heart and the will of God expressed through his word, we think about the way that they're so desperate to remove anything from our society or our culture that even speaks of any kind of a commandment from God, to remove it entirely from any kind of public discussion. And there's so much of the world today, and certainly here in our country, that there is a war going on related to that. But make no mistake, that is a spiritual battle. And there are people who will be part of these ranks of people, this kind of people that are alive even now today, that are in this battle, in this incredible fight against God that they're currently engaged in. And they are just as zealous now as these people that we're seeing here in our text. What's interesting, I think, in all of this is you look at what happens here with this judgment and the way that people just dig in in their unrepentance. It's like they are just going to fight God all of the way. In spite of all of this judgment that he brings, all of the mercy that he shows, they are going to fight him tooth and nail till the death. And what happens when you have a situation like that is that either God is going to win and we will someday have a world the way that he desires, or they're going to win, and we're going to have a world that they desire. But they both cannot win. Right? They both can't win. And there are people like this that will fight God to the death, and it's going to require God's judgment of them to put a stop to them and to put a stop to their influence. Again, 
either they're going to win and we're going to have the world that they want or God's going to win and we're going to have the world that he wants. But the world that they would have would be such a terrible and a horrifying place to live that God out of his love and out of his holiness and out of his righteousness, he will not let these people win. He cannot let these people win. He has to bring judgment and bring an end to their rebellion and he will bring judgment and he will bring an end to their rebellion and understand that it is his love and his grace and it's out of his righteousness that he'll be forced to do that. This chapter is, I think, such a clear picture of how evil men's hearts can so easily become when they would rather live for evil than for God. They did not repent. They are personally responsible for their decisions. Now you may be here this morning and you may be in the middle of waging your own personal war with God. You may be in a place where you also are unwilling to repent of whatever it is that you have placed in your life in front of him. And I can promise you on the authority of the scriptures that it will not end well at all. I can also promise you that God doesn't want to be at war with you. That's why Jesus came and gave his life on the cross so that we could be reconciled to God and so that we could now once and for all be at peace with God and we could enjoy the peace of God and yet we need to stop fighting against God and we need to choose him instead. Now this morning as we finish up, we're gonna celebrate communion and what an appropriate time to do this. Aren't you glad this morning to be saved? if you're saved. Here at Calvary Chapel, communion is open, which means that the only requirement to partake of communion is that you're a born-again believer in Jesus. You don't need to show us your church membership or go through a class. If you're a born-again believer, you are welcome to come and to partake of communion. And if you're not a born-again believer, we can take care of that even before we take communion. As we start to worship, I'm going to invite everybody to come forward and you can take the communion elements back to your seat and just take some time with the Lord, consider some of the things that he's shown us this morning, consider the sacrifice of Jesus, you know, thankful, so thankful to be saved. And for those of you who haven't started your personal relationship with Jesus, um, we're going to have some people up front here, maybe Pastor Chris, uh, Pastor Jeff, maybe you guys would come forward, a couple of the ladies, Anne, Heather, maybe. Um, but there'll be people up here who can pray with you and help get you started um, down that path, and you too can partake of communion with us, but more importantly, you can partake of, um, of life the way that it was meant to be lived, right? through faith in Jesus and a connection with, uh, with the Lord the way you've never experienced it before. So uh, let's pray, and then uh, Kissy will start to lead us, and you can come forward and uh, receive communion. And then when we're done, I'll come back up and dismiss us, and we'll head out uh, to enjoy some food today. So Father, we thank you so much. We do thank you, Lord, for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, Lord. We thank you for a text like the text today, Lord, as difficult as it is, Lord, as challenging as it can be. Lord, we thank you for your great love that you include um, even these difficult things like this in your word to us, Lord, so that your spirit can speak through them. Um, Lord, and maybe there's some here this morning who needed to be shaken, Lord, kind of out of their comfort zone, Lord, who um, needed to hear this, Lord, in order to understand um, 
Lord, the choice that's before them, Lord. And so if those are any like that here today, Lord, I pray that you would continue to speak to their hearts, Lord, and that by the power of your spirit, you would draw them unto yourself, Lord. Draw them into that place where they would desire to repent, Lord, and to, to take whatever it is that they have placed ahead of you, Lord, and to, to repent of that, Lord, to put that thing out of the way and to put you into that place of prominence and preeminence in their lives. And so we thank you, Lord. We pray that as we go to this time of communion, Lord, that you would just bless it. Lord, we pray that you would make the reality of the cross as fresh and as new to us this morning as it was that day when we first understood and gave our lives to you. And so we thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.